So if there are any questions as we, as we go through, uh, please ask them in the q and I'll try and keep an eye on it while uh, James is talking. And I know that some of you already met us uh, last week on the introduction section, but maybe James, we just introduce ourselves briefly if you want to go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm James Dallas. I'm the executive director of the Energy Law Institute. I've been with it since its inception, pretty much. Uh, I spent about 40 years in um, the private sector working for law firms and indeed for an energy company briefly. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Nora Gallagher, as, as some of you met us last week, so welcome back. Um, uh, I am the Academic Director of the Energy, Energy Law Institute, although I've been working at Queen Mary since 2002, uh, teaching investment treaty arbitration. Um, I'm a public international lawyer by training, actually, uh, and worked with um, Sir Eddie Ladderpact in, in, in Cambridge before, after I was working in Clifford Chance in Finance and before I went to work with Herbert Smith Freehills in uh, international dispute resolution. So we did all sorts of uh, commercial disputes, investor disputes, state-state disputes, um, and many of them were involved uh, in the energy sector. And of course now uh, I'm teaching um, in energy transactions and also sit as arbitrator. So it's kind of handy that a lot of the disputes that I see and decide on uh, are looking at how provisions in JOAs or upstream granting instruments uh, or um, sale of assets in energy um, um, projects uh, when they end up in dispute and how they're interpreted. So that's quite quite useful. Uh, the, for today, of course, we're not looking at, at, at contracts as such. We're just having an overview uh, of um, energy and climate change and why the climate change and the energy transition, which is a word you'll have heard a lot, or uh, uh, the climate crisis, uh, and why that will impact the energy sector so significantly. So this is based on our new model that ran for the first time last year. Um, and I will hand over to James to set out the structure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nora. And actually, I should say, in my 40 years, I spent a lot of time, but as a, as a private lawyer, largely dealing with transactions between companies and corporations, although obviously um, it did involve government and government grants and so on. Um, but a slightly different background, and I hope a complementary one to Nora's. This is, as Nora says, a taster. Um, the, the module actually runs, is a 15 credit module, so 15 hours of teaching. Um, and this is um, just a, an introduction, an overview. So it's necessarily a bit selective. Please, please do ask questions as we go along. Um, our style generally is to make these things interactive. It's much more fun. I think for you, and actually it's much more fun for us because if, if it's merely us speaking, it can get quite dull. Um, I also apologize slightly for the slides because in reducing them to a much smaller number, um, it's tended to get rid of the ones which have interesting graphics and so on. So anyway, there we are. Um, but here's a whistle stop too. So if we just turn to the first slide, which says what we're doing, we're going to spend an hour. I now can't see it because of the um, questions that I've got open, but that's fine. Um, no, I've, I've, I've moved the questions, sorry. Um, so it starts with, no, no, that, that's fine. If you go on to, to the contents. Back, 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 back. Where are we going? I, it's just that I can't see them because I've got the chat over the top. If you, if, you, if you close your chat, see there's a little square on the top right of the chat, just close that so it's not in your way. Because I don't have that on my screen, so I can't see what you're seeing. Yes. Uh, I have the contents part one, two, three, four I, open. For some reason I can't get up there to close it. Um, it's called mm. my inadequacy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so we'll start with a little look at, quite a rudimentary look at the science. Uh, and for those of you who've followed the whole climate change debate, you'll know that the first port of call for a lot of people who've not wanted to do anything about climate change, uh, perhaps this is a, a little unfair, but it's to be to challenge the science, that now seems to be pretty uh, much universally accepted, and talk about why, why it's a concern. We'll then look very specifically at the issue of public international law. I said I was about law. Um, it, this is an area Nora knows much more about, but there's an interesting, when you look at the nature of the problem and you look at public international law, there are some quite interesting, I think, observations to make about that. We'll then talk about the primary um, treaties, the public international law treaties, which have been fashioned to deal with some of these problems, and then end up with um, some comments on climate change disputes. 
of which there are a growing number. So I'm going to start with the science uh, and the problem. So what is the greenhouse effect? Um, is there anybody out there who would like to try and explain what the greenhouse effect is? Uh, no open questions I've got here. Yeah, I was just clearing the screen so I could see when the new question came in, sorry. If anybody, if, if you want to just um, I mean, you're not, I'm not expecting anybody, and nor is more of people to know the answers to these questions, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll explain in general terms. So it's a natural process in which the energy from the sun, the radiation coming down to earth, some of it gets trapped in our atmosphere, bounces back into space, but the rest of it comes down to earth, it gets absorbed by the earth um, and by the sea, and that warms up the earth. The earth radiates heat back up to the atmosphere. Some of it stops there and bounces back and some of it goes through and into space. But the sort of net effect of all of that is that the earth is warmer than it otherwise would be. It operates in effect like a blanket. It's very important. And here, here's another question which anybody can just put a number up in, in the questions or the chats. Uh, we're doing the Q&A section. Um, if you take the moon, which doesn't have an atmosphere like the Earth does, anybody guess what the average temperature during the day is uh, on the moon? and what the average temperature at night is on the moon, which, by the way, has a much longer day and night than we do. You're allowed to guess and not Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anybody want to hazard a guess? So daytime. Let's get one answer. Must be somebody who has a view. So there's nothing stopping, you know, the, bear in mind that the moon is very close to us and therefore very close, to, uh, equally close to the sun. It's only 70,000 miles away. Uh, sorry, James, I just um, had a comment from Alan. Um, I, I think that everybody can hear us except for Alan, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on. He might need to start and restart his computer, but we'll, we'll continue and I'll text that to him. Oh, okay. Um, Any answer? I don't see any anybody's guess. Oh, hang on, we have a guess. Ah, Lisa, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well done. Over a hundred degrees centigrade, and uh, and at night, Lisa, any idea what that might be? Might already, but it's it's very, very, very cold. Um, the average uh, the average temperature they suggest is minus one hundred eighty seven degrees. A centigrade. So, so thank you very much, Lisa, for that. Um, I mean, the point about it, and now we can move on to the old locks effect. Yep. No, no, you have done. That's great. Um, is that is actually it's not a bad thing. It's a very important thing. In fact, without this um, effect from the atmosphere, you wouldn't be able to sustain life on Earth. The Goldilocks effect. Is, it's applied to lots of different things, but it's it's the notion that it's neither too hot nor too cold. It's perfect. And in this case, perfect for sustaining life. It maintains the Earth's temperature uh, at about 33 degrees warmer than it otherwise would be. Um, and we've talked about the moon. But it's a very delicate balance. Uh, and the gases in the atmosphere, which have this absorbing effect, are the greenhouse gases, which you've heard so much about, um, and again, I don't know if people, it's quite difficult, this Q&A session, but there are, uh, does anybody know what the principal greenhouse gases are? I may, if it's difficult for people to go online, then I'll move on. But does anybody want to have a crack at what the main ones are? Just wait a second. I think we're getting some guess rather than Google, but... Yeah, hang on, we have. Yeah. 
CO2, that's yep, methane. methane, yep. Very good. And that's excellent that you've focused on those because they're the ones I'm going to talk about most. They're the ones about which there is most discussion. So there's water vapour um, and ozone, which is made up of three oxygen molecules and is found in the stratosphere and actually plays an important role in stopping us being uh, subject to ultraviolet radiation. The fluorinated gases, which are all those gases which you may recall CFCs and HFCs, which are all man-made, they don't exist in, uh, in normal circumstances and are used for things like refrigeration and air conditioning and so on. And then there's nitrous oxide, um, which is found in vehicle exhausts, burning coal, oil, diesel, they all produce NOx. But by far the most important are CO2 and methane. Um, and can anybody hazard a guess how, what percentage of the atmosphere is methane? Sorry, is not methane, is CO2, carbon dioxide. Oop, I obviously jumped ahead too much. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Did it you blew guess? that one. Okay, well, the thing, and actually it's a feature, you can, you can move on because we'll, we'll uh, um, what is interesting is just how small a component it is of the atmosphere. And indeed, when you listen to all of the numbers that people talk about in context of the science, two degrees, one degree above pre-industrial average temperature levels, um, the amount of CO2, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is 0.03%. So three hundredths of, um, you know, of a percentage point. But in terms of its impact on greenhouse gases, and global warming is very significant. So if you move to the next slide, Nora, thank you. Can you see the slides now? You can. Yeah, that's great. I can see bits of them, but I've got my own copy here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on the carbon dioxide one. Yeah, so that's fine. So it, just, it says they're a very small component, but mm -hmm. big component um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions you know, excluding water vapour over which we have really no control, that is, you know, created by evaporation um, and transpiration from plants, that's just the clouds. It's not created by man in that sense, and there's nothing we can do to control it, although it's a very important greenhouse gas. But the ones that we have responsibility for, in particular CO2 and methane, are the ones that have the biggest impact, so you can see 76% uh, methane, 16% nitrous oxide, 6%. And CO2, there's lots of it that comes from uh, natural causes, so our breathing and the breathing of all uh, aerobic organisms, all mammals and, and other animals that are aerobic. Uh, volcanic eruptions and forest fires release lots of carbon dioxide. Transpiration from plants, that's the process. During the day, they carry out, as you know, photosynthesis. That releases oxygen and they use CO2 in order to create sugars and energy. When they use those energies at night, then they release some CO2, but the net balance is very much in favor of photosynthesis, thankfully. Decomposition of organic material, again, rotting vegetation. But the key, the man-made sources and the ones that really matter, the burning of fossil fuels, cement production, which uses, uh, um, emits lots of CO2, and then, of course, deforestation. And we'll look later at population, but deforestation is such a big issue because the photosynthesis of trees is incredibly important to keeping in balance CO2 and CO2 emissions because it absorbs it during the photosynthesis process and trees are enormous and, and are able to absorb a lot. So somewhere like the Amazon forest uh, absorbs tons of CO2. Um, what's happening is in order to feed us all, we are chopping down forests and in so doing, and we may leave grass, but grass doesn't use 
uh, uh, doesn't absorb as much CO2 as, as plants. And then we're allowing cattle and sheep to graze on it, and they in turn produce methane, as we'll come on to. So um, the next slide is just about CO2 sinks. So this is a sort of balancing mechanism. This is, these are the things that naturally hold the CO2 emissions in balance by absorbing it. Forests I've just talked about, but actually more importantly are the oceans which, uh, in which CO2 dissolves and then um, the phytoplankton, which also photosynthesizes, dissolves it and they're by far the, the biggest carbon sink. The other, um, uh, the other gas I wanted to talk about, because there isn't really time to talk about it, is methane. Now, methane is much, much more potent than CO2. Um, I think it's something like 70 times more potent. So David King has very strong views on this, the former UK government scientist. He, it's often represented that methane is 15 or 20 times more potent uh, than carbon dioxide. But the reason that, that that number is used is because it's reflecting not only the powers of absorption, but also how long they live for their shelf life. And methane, by and large, has a much, much shorter uh, lifespan in the atmosphere, say 10, 20 years, whereas CO2 that we're emitting now is accumulating and accumulating and will be there for several hundred years. And so when they put the, that, those two together, they say it's 20 times uh, worse, if you like, for global warming. So CO2 uh, is the equivalent of kind of nuclear waste, if yeah. you will, for the atmosphere. Yeah, because I mean, it's, I mean, this is one of the things, again, that people, I think, don't fully appreciate is that even if we stop everything today, we've got a problem that's up there which will continue to reflect itself in some of the negative and adverse consequences which we'll talk about later, because it's cumulative. It doesn't disappear. And unless we find some way of stripping it out of the atmosphere, it's going to just go on accumulating and accumulating. So, um, so as I say, methane, uh, a methane you get naturally from rotting vegetation. Wetlands produce tons of it. Um, uh, it comes up through root systems and, uh, and out into the atmosphere. Those root systems are actually designed to enable the trees in wetlands to absorb uh, oxygen and release oxygen, but actually it also allows for methane. And cows, sheep and other ruminants uh, with their complicated four chamber, which again, this is another one of Nora's specialist subjects. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they have four chambered stomachs um, and they produce a lot of methane. So again, you can see how this all links in with people's diets, population, increasing numbers of people eating food, chopping down forests in order to create more sheep, more cows to be eaten by us. Man-made sources, well, energy leaks from pipelines is a big issue. Um, waste and landfill produces methane, as does burning biomass, and rice production is a very big source of methane. So, Next slide. Well, what is, what's the problem with all of this? Um, and historically, the CO2 levels have fluctuated quite considerably. We've had ice ages and we've had the opposite. And indeed, I believe we're, technically we're coming out of with the tail end of an ice age. Um, and occasionally the CO2 um, parts per million in the atmosphere would be very high in the Cretaceous period, something like 2,000 parts per million. And there probably wasn't any ice either at either end of the earth. But for the last 800,000 years, it's been pretty constant and stable in a range 180 to 300 parts per million. The average pre-industrial levels were, as I said on the slide, 180. Um, and over a thousand years, we've only seen an increase, or we saw an increase of something like 35 parts per million. 
but currently it's increasing at two parts per million every year. Um, and global temperatures track very much the increases in CO2. And I, I didn't go online this time just to check, but um, in Hawaii, there is a station which is which looks at and logs the CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's over 440 parts per million uh, and rising because we're continuing to put more and more greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 and methane. And, and the consequences of that, why, why, you know, what does it mean for us? Well, there's a very graphic example. There's huge concerns about the melting of the polar ice caps uh, and indeed what happens if we start melting the permafrost. Not only is it bad for polar bears, but what you're gonna see are sea levels rise and, and it's possible, depending if we do absolutely nothing about it, and if, and if the average temperatures rise to levels, which some predict they can do, that you'll get a permanent melt, and with it, an increase in the um, sea levels of three to five meters, which will take out some of the biggest cities and towns around the world, most of, many of which, of course, are located near to sea. This is another great picture. Um, I can't see the dates nor on, on mine. 1984 on the left, September 1984, and then fast forward to September 2016. You can see the significant decrease. Now, obviously, there's always some movement up there. It is, it's, it's, it's moving anyway, but it's the decrease, the marked decrease, that's the issue it there. Um, and the other thing, again, I, I said, to me, one of the difficult issues, gosh, those are the California fires. And of course, since then, we've had also those huge fires all over Australia, uh, all of which emit enormous amounts of CO2 as well, um, as well as being devastating in lots of other ways. But, you know, when you look at the numbers, they seem so small, you know, a 1% or 2% increase in um, average global temperatures. Well, lots of people think, well, that would be jolly nice if our country was one or two degrees warmer. But actually, A, the consequences are, uh, are not evenly spread. B, they're accompanied by enormous volatility. So we're seeing great extremes. We see long-term droughts. We see hurricanes increasing and cyclones, massive flooding all over the world all of which is caused by this additional volatility which climate change engenders. Uh, and with it, the long-term impacts mean that you're gonna lose crops, it's going to have an effect on the health uh, as air quality gets worse, um, and you're gonna end up with climate refugees, people who are no longer able to live in particularly places like the uh, islands in the Pacific, low-lying islands will just be inundated and people will have to move from there and, and people living at the coast if we get the levels of increase. So it's very significant and if you want to understand more about it, um, and I don't think there was a question at the end of that, Nora, if we just move to the next one, there are a couple of slides, let me keep an eye on how are we doing time-wise, not so well, so I, I'm going to flick very quickly, but look at the uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change and you'll understand why they're recommending and the Paris Agreement which Nora will talk about talks about 1.5 percent as a, the long-term target rather than two very fine margins but it makes a big difference and and these two slides I'm just going to flick over but one of the consequences is that for example Arctic oceans will be free of ice, they say one in a hundred years, if we manage to hold the increase to 1.5% uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. It'll be one in 10 if we can only hold it to two degrees. And at the moment, we're nowhere near even being able to achieve that. And for coral reefs, it's the end if we get to two degrees, and uh, that's just an example. So I'm not gonna go through uh, the rest of that. Um, we've got some quotes, and I'm gonna leave those with you, um, but the problem has been recognized 
from the 80s, 70s, 80s, people were beginning to get very concerned about, um, about the consequences on the environment. Not so much that it didn't, actually was more about the consumption of resources, but that then people get, began to talk about the impact on climate change. Um, and you can hear, see here, the environmental challenge that confronts the whole world demands an equivalent response from the whole world. Every country will be affected and no one can opt out. Those countries who are industrialized must contribute more to help those who are not. Well, that, you know, that was back in 1989. And where are we today? And Barack it's, Obama, yeah. It is very interesting. I, 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 um, I watched actually, uh, just to remind myself that there, it's available on YouTube, the Margaret Thatcher she presented that uh, to the UN General Assembly, uh, as you say, as far back as 1989. Uh, it's over, uh, well over 30 years ago. So the problem was recognised, although maybe couched in different terms, but actually she captures very well there the common but differentiated obligations that are then entrenched later and formalised and encapsulated uh, in international treaties. So she was uh, ahead of her time, if you will, perhaps not terribly popular with the coal miners up the north, but ahead of her time. Yeah, and of course, you know, the great advantage she had was she was a scientist. She'd read chemistry at university uh, and she understood this. And apparently she called all the cabinet in and gave them a day's... Well, she didn't do it. She got scientists in to give them a lecture, which none of them particularly liked. Um, but I hope you're liking this lecture anyway. Um, <laughs> and I'm just going to quickly move on because, um, to the, the second limb, which was really just to talk about the law and climate change. Um, now, uh, yes, so that, I can't see, there should be a... Do you, the challenge of public international law is this what you want? Yes. I just want, uh, just on this one here, yes. um, I had actually, I wanted to say at the beginning, um, there is a very good book. You don't actually have to buy it at all. Uh, I just old-fashioned and I like to hold it. It's called The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. And uh, it's actually available. You can read it online. I know that all the new generation are well able to read uh, more than two pages like I am online. I actually have to have it in my hand. Uh, and we also get asked, uh, and just in case we forget, you know, if there's any background reading that would be useful. And in fact, this book here, I hope you can all see it, International Climate Change Law, uh, it's by OUP and Dave, written by David Badansky, Jutta Brené and Lavinia Rajamani. Um, it's very good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good read. It's, it's actually very accessible. It's, it's not like what I would consider to be a very scary form of public international law book, but it has all of the details of the negotiation uh, background to the various treaties. The Rio uh, treaties is what they're called because they start out with the Rio um, Declaration. Uh, um, and so definitely worth those two worth a read. But on this slide, I just wanted to say it's interesting to me, and James kind of alluded to it, that the the science, I suppose, 15, 20, 30 years ago, wasn't as definitive as it is today. There were much more, there, there was concerns, but they weren't entirely sure. Whereas I think that the language around uh, the climate crisis, it used to be climate change or global warming, but now it's called climate crisis. So there's an urgency in the language, both of the politicians and of the scientists. Uh, and, there, and uh, wrapped up in that is the significant shift that the energy sector has to make towards green, sustainable, uh, viable uh, power generation because if we're all going as an example people forget oh yes we're going to buy an electric vehicle well that's great I'm a farmer they haven't got electric tractors yet or something that I can tow my trailer to to the factory um, but also if everybody goes to electric vehicles you'll need more power so where is that additional power requirement going to come from so there's lots of problems with the energy transition, which is the move away from non-renewable fossil fuels. When I say non-renewable, not within a couple of hundred million years it takes to make coal and oil and gas. Um, people, uh, and Sir Richard Friend at our annual Clifford Chance lecture two years ago mentioned that actually science and technology hopefully will be able to save us so that there will be some big technological breakthrough. And I don't mean, you know, my dad's idea of, well, why can't they just make a big hoover and suck all the CO2 emissions out of the atmosphere? I mean, technology that's like storage capacity could be increased and sit along the national grid to deal with the problem of intermittency of solar because we get some sun here in Ireland but it doesn't shine every day or the wind doesn't blow every uh, all the time. So you need to solve those intermittency problems because people right across the world have become used to being able to turn on a switch and 
power their mobile phone. And if they can't do that, there's going to be uh, uh, unrest. So it's a matter of moving that money uh, in that direction. Uh, and then, of course, this is a challenge that James is going to speak about, about how do you do that through the carrot and stick incentive uh, or, or mandatory requirements uh, in uh, international law. Um, and Nora's right. The, the, the thing is the actual transition, how you move from a society which relies on fossil fuels to one that doesn't isn't a simple flick of a switch. There are, I mean, a lot of the assets and infrastructure that are required for the production of energy and electricity and, and all of the power that we use. Um, these are assets which take, which last for 30 or 40 years. And indeed, they need to have contracts and arrangements in place for at least 20 or 30 years to be able to sustain the financing uh, and yeah. get the investment in it necessary. So if, if we move faster, we're going to be leaving a lot of assets, very expensive assets that are financed. Um, and we're going to leave oil and gas in the ground. And we're going to leave other assets stranded. And that has lots of consequences as well. So it's not a simple process. All this, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but all this is about is really to say one thing, that when you look at the problems of climate change, there's really, you know, there are two key themes. There's mitigation, which is finding ways to reduce the emission of harmful greenhouse gases. And then there's adaptation. And adaptation is recognizing that even if we do mitigate, there are some consequences which will inevitably flow from the emissions that have already occurred, um, uh, which will mean that we've got to spend money on, depending on where we are, raising sea walls, uh, uh, developing crops that are uh, drought resistant and so on. But adaptation by and large tends to be, if you like, local. It's individual countries affected in particular ways. Mitigation is really the global issue and it requires global solutions. Um, and those global solutions take you into um, the whole question of public international law. And all I wanted to highlight is, there's a slide which just says what the sources of international law are, which is the next one, but I'm just gonna focus on treaties. And treaties are basically, as you know, the agreements between states under which they undertake to do various things or not do various things. Um, but the big challenge is it's not like domestic law. The, with domestic law, you usually have a parliament, you have a constitution which invests in that parliament, the power to make laws and the remit the, uh, and the scope of those laws. Um, if you're in a democracy, the members of that parliament have been elected there and they have power to make laws uh, and they are then able through the courts to enforce those laws and they have police forces um, which can then take the necessary action if the enforcement is insufficient through the courts. But of course, public international law is completely different. You've got independent sovereign states with their own powers and they cannot be forced to enter into agreements. They've got to be encouraged and coerced and feel it's in the best interests of their parties. There is no supranational legislative body that's there and able to say, this is what we need. We've got to get to 1.5 degrees C and these are the laws that we promulgated and you've all got to, to take note of them. And so I won't say more than that, but it is a fundamental difference which possibly explains why we edge an inch forward with the treaties that we've got rather than taking the kind of decisive action which most of us would like to see. Nora. And know. Ellie would be delighted with this slide. My former boss, Ellie Lauderpact, who was one of the preeminent public international lawyers from the 1950s, in fact, advised the Anglo-Iranian oil company in its dispute um, uh, with BP. But um, he used to love to ask his new assistants, and I worked with him, um, well, you know, is public international law really law at all? 
Uh, and of course, I pragmatically turned around and said, well, it must be because you spent the last 45 years working in it. So it has to be an area which I think maybe that's one of the reasons why we got on so well. But actually, it is it is an issue. Some people, because there isn't an enforcement mechanism. Uh, and yes, OK, we have the United Nations, which is meant to be ensuring peace and um and maintaining peace and security globally and has some functions and has uh, in, in created an environmental program uh, to look at this and has a climate committee and feeds into the intergovernmental um, panel on climate change that James already mentioned. So there are, uh, and treaties of course do have and can have binding uh, obligations within them and if there are breaches then, then there can be consequences. So it's not without its teeth, it's just as James said to be able to get the majority buy-in of our what is 194 member states globally you sometimes have to come down to the lowest common denominator so what is agreed in a treaty is often a very um, tightly fought battle between what some states really want uh, and what other states are prepared to accept and of course you can all think you know, the geopolitics, even around oil and gas, has changed significantly since the 1970s. And now around climate change, there's also, um, it's a difficulty of, you know, changing people's mindsets. And I can say this because I have a, a stepmom living in uh, Kansas City who not only has one big, huge, massive um, life-size fridge that I could fit into uh, in her kitchen, she has one in the basement uh, and one uh, in the garage just in case. So it's very difficult to change people. And then she says, well, we must do something about this climate change. And I'm thinking, yes, you need to change how you live your life. But, but the, the change to be able to impose on the international level, which then filters down to the local level, uh, is not an easy easy uh, task. So it, it probably explains, as James says, why the process has been so slow. Yeah, uh, and yeah, absolutely. That slide merely sort of reinforces the point that you have to do it by agreement. The more ambitious you are, the fewer participants you'll get in your treaty. Have a look at Kyoto versus Paris Agreement and the fewer people comply with it. There are then two slides which just emphasise, again, the enormous challenge. You've got so many different parties with such different positions, all of whom have to be reconciled if we're going to come to a, a solution to, to climate change. So most importantly on the left, developed countries, the ones who've been uh, emitting the most in the past and ha have developed industrial economies versus those who are some way behind them and want to catch up. But you've got coastal landlocked, you've got uh, petro economies and those who aren't you uh, and so it goes on on the second one there's another slide again which shows you some of these and of course then you've got the challenge perhaps the second biggest dilemma the green one there you've got who, who bears the cost of it is it today's generation or is it future generations so that's merely to demonstrate and the final slide I'm going to touch on is world population, which is linked to it. Because when we talk about developing countries, these are all people who are entitled to see their lives improve or, or believe they're entitled to, which, which I think I agree with. Um, but what we've seen is massive increase in world population and linked with that, of course, increase in the use of, uh, of energy. If you go back to 1800, that was the first time the population reached 1 billion in 1980, because we're 40 years old at the Centre for Commercial Law Study, we were looking at the population then, it was something like 4.4 uh, 4 billion. It's now 7.8 billion. That's an increase in those 40 years of 3.4 billion, which is more than the popula whole population of the world was in 1960. Um, and that's a sort of compounding issue. I'm going to hand back to Nora now. Yeah, well, actually, I'm unconscious of time, and I'm going to just ask if there's any questions. I know that there was somebody asked about the slides, and I'm sure that there is a way. I think I will be able to send them in the chat uh, just before we end, so that then you can all download them on your computer. I think that that's probably the quickest way to do it. But are there any questions about the kind of, I suppose, the cause, effect? Uh, does everybody understand, I suppose, the kind of, diplomatic dance, if you will, that is done around the negotiation. Uh, and you probably all heard of the, 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 the COPs or the uh, conferences of the parties where they meet each year to try and uh, reach some sort of consensus on how to address the climate crisis. In fact, the COP26 was meant to be uh, in Scotland uh, later this year, but has been postponed until next year. Do they have a date for that yet uh, next year, James? 
Um, they do. I haven't got it. it. It's again, it's in November. It is. Uh, so November 2021. It's so a whole year thanks to the COVID. Indeed. And yeah. James didn't mention the COVID. Um, obviously, all of our lives have been, well, shattered and, and completely rearranged, if you will, uh, by a one in 100 year event. So I'm not feeling terribly blessed. Um, I've been on farm here since lockdown started uh, in Ireland in March uh, 13. Uh, and it it it's actually, it's caused quite a lot of discussion in the industry, um, not just with politicians, but in the energy industry itself as to whether or not this will act as a fast forward button, if you will, to people taking quicker steps because they see how quickly uh, all of the emissions were reduced. So nobody's getting into a plane anymore. Nobody's traveling. Everybody's staying close to home. Everybody's buying local. Um, so uh, there's been a huge uh, maybe impetus to, to see that we can actually do more quickly to redress the imbalance that James mentioned uh, at the very beginning of his presentation. So that is something that I cannot predict. I've made predictions to students in the past and I've got some of them wrong, but, <laughs> but it's very difficult to predict exactly where it's going to go. But I'm hoping that it will be a positive impact uh, that, uh, on, the, on the energy transition and ultimately be progressive for the climate challenge. I'm not sure, James, whether you have heard anything from inside. No, I mean, it's really interesting. You know, it's an opportunity for government now to make some decisions because, as you rightly say, people have found ways of conducting business and, and, and going about their work without necessarily having to go to offices and without having to fly all over the world. Um, and I'm sure that there will be some changes. Or pe people will work more at home. But if, if we could reduce uh, air travel, that would be fantastic. And I think business really could do that. But it requires governments to, to, to take measures which they need to be brave about for example, not making it tax deductible for companies to send their people around the world or only give them a certain amount. Anyway, um, uh, and the other thing I think I uh, totally agree with you, we, you know, people have demonstrated that things that we didn't think was possible are. The other thing is governments have mobilized amounts of money which uh, they've never done before. Um, one of the arguments against mitigating and acting now has been the enormous cost to the world economy. Well, it's quite clear that governments, if they want to, can do it. So. Yeah, um, there's just a question on uh, if you haven't studied uh, climate change. Uh, in fact, all of our modules, and we say this in induction again in September, uh, they're designed and each year we have students who either come straight in from undergrad or who have worked but in a completely different area. So, in fact, one year we had an engineer who had been busy drilling offshore but didn't have any uh, any exposure to public international law or um, uh, contracts. So all of our modules are designed, Marion, to accommodate students who do not have any particular background uh, in the area, including climate change, which, you know, I, this module is, it's, it's only, we just did it last year, so it's, a, it's still very new. Uh, we're still, you know, kind of figuring out exactly what should go into it. We, we covered things like uh, green bonds, sustainable finance, uh, efficiency, um, um, dispute resolution, climate change dispute resolution, and of course, the public international law regime uh, and the Climate Change Act 2008 of the UK, which we'll come back and talk about very quickly. I'm conscious of time, but definitely you wouldn't necessarily have to read anything in advance. I did post the two, I typed in the two names of the Davis Wallace Wells uh, and climate change book. They are useful uh, just by way of general background, even if you don't take the module or even if you decide to specialize in something else, they're actually just really good reading in any event. Um, as I say, I'm very conscious of time. I, I, I know that you're here voluntarily, so I am going to uh, yeah. crack on. Um, let me just, okay. So um, actually, Dave, James talked about climate change. I, it's interesting here in Ireland, just as an example, although we're not terribly certain of the science and for sure when they were drafting the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, again, the, the, the exact nature of the changes were still largely unknown. But I can say here, having moved back to Ireland from Singapore uh, about five or six years ago, we've had our first drought in 2018. We had the worst snows in about 15 years in the March of 2018. Uh, and we had our first hurricane uh, later in that year of 2018. So we have had some what they call extreme weather events, um, uh, which is rather uncomfortable because we're a country that's used to and relies on our entirely grass-fed uh, cows that are out 
12 months of the year. So we don't house them ever. Um, they live out in the grass and they're all very happy and produce nice high protein milk quantity and good meat as a result. So our entire system, uh, grass-based system of of, um, of cattle production uh, and dairy would be compromised uh, if, if uh, such weather events uh, persisted. You probably all have heard of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is actually the convention that set up the COP that you all hear about. So COP25 last year in December, uh, which was meant to be in uh, Chile, but was moved to Spain. Um, and its main aim was to mitigate uh, climate change mitigation. And James mentioned mitigation and adaptation as a kind of a two prong approach. So they started off with mitigation back in uh, 1992. So that's a long time ago. So some proponents uh, and actors in this field are disappointed and upset that more action hasn't been taken quicker. Uh, I just note that I think it's very interesting that if you read the entire way through that framework convention, which is all it is, it's literally just a framework of how work will pro progress in the future. There's no mention to renewables. So back in 1992, they didn't really have uh, I suppose if you think about the renewable market at the time, it would have been very new, would have been very expensive, would have been very exclusive. I don't even think the first offshore wind farm in the UK had been built yet. Uh, that was later in the, in the mid-90s, if I recall. And if you think about how much production is now made in the UK, uh, that's a significant change. That's just uh, basically the objective set out in Article 2, to stabilise uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, and obviously that is what they have been working towards. Later in the later 1990s, a bit more urgency uh, and a bit more uh, teeth in this treaty. So there was obligations that uh, Annex A parties had to comply with. So it was actually the developed country were being held to account and asked to put more effort and more money into the pot uh, in order to redress uh, climate change, which was not terribly popular. And the US uh, never signed up for it. Uh, it Slowly over time, there was various five-year phases of it where um, um, there was a clean development mechanisms, so projects that could be invested that were approved uh, as mitigating uh, climate change. Um, but they're beginning; they, they weren't very successful at the outset, um, and it was only came in force in 2005. So not as many member states signed up to this, and that is back to James's point that they felt that the obligations were too. Um, uh, uh, progressive and they felt that they would adversely impact uh, their uh, economies and ability to be able to develop in particular in the oil and gas sector. And then of course everybody who hasn't heard of the Paris Agreement, even anybody who has not studied or been in any way interested in climate change, and I confess that I have neighbours here out in the country who don't believe that climate change is actually happening and they just think that there's always been a bit of a shift uh, in, in global temperatures. Um, but you can see from the number of parties, 196 parties that have signed it and 187 ratified. Uh, and actually the US, although it gave notice, or the, Trump gave notice that they were withdrawing uh, from the Paris Agreement, they will still be a party and bound by its terms until November 2020 because of, of the period of time that it takes to give notice. Um, and uh, it, it, it's interesting that this basically set out a framework or guideline as to how states are going to implement certain measures uh, to mitigate and adapt for climate change. So each country, you can check online, every one of your countries will have um, submitted a, a, what they call a nationally determined contribution. So this will be a roadmap of how your government anticipates taking measures uh, on climate change over a five-year period. And then uh, each country has to go and report at the COPs. The last year, I think New Zealand in December uh, 2019 reported on measures that had taken and how effective they had been and how they're going to follow up. So although there's no enforcement mechanism uh, in the Paris Agreement for failing to do so, and again, it's back to James's point between whether they wanted something. Some people, especially David King, wanted more uh, enforcement mechanisms. And if you don't meet your targets, that there, some action could be taken against you. Um, but that wasn't approved. And uh, so we have more like a gentleman's agreement that everybody's in, or the 196 states are in and working together. 
but there's no way of enforcing whether or not they reach those nationally determined contributions. So it's actually a good exercise. You should go and have a look and see online. Some of them are longer than others. I think India's uh, nationally determined contributions is about 10 or 11 pages. Others are a one page. And I think the EU member states, it was the EU that submitted a, a common document about five pages long for um, all of the 28, soon to be 27 uh, EU member states. So that's uh, just... Um, the public international law treaties to be available that are to, to be aware of that impact in this area. Uh, but there's also, you know, uh, international organizations, so intergovernmental organizations like IRENA, so that's the uh, International Renew Renewable Energy Agency that is working with governments on regulation that will facilitate and support uh, investment into renewable uh, um, projects. Uh, the International Energy Agency sitting in Paris, uh, I thought it was quite interesting, confirmed that the Paris Agreement is at its heart an agreement about energy. Uh, now that wouldn't necessarily have come out if you look at the Travaux Preparatoire of Paris, but it's interesting that the International Energy Agency identified it as such. Uh, I don't know if James, if you have any uh, comment on that. No, but I mean, to, to me, um, energy is completely at the heart of it. It's 60, 70, um, people use percentages, say, sort of 70% of global warming is in the energy sector. But the reality is it's all about fossil fuels and it's all about energy consumption. So, yeah, I think it is completely at the heart of it. And this is the, tr the treaty where the states come together to try to address the problem collectively. Yeah. Mm. Just to be aware of other more recent uh, developments, obviously, and it's specifically stated in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, the aim is to keep temperatures below a 2% two, two two degree Celsius increase from pre-industrial levels. And actually, the pre-industrial level is set in previous treaties as usually it's about 1990. Um, although, as James mentioned, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their uh, report two years ago said, actually, if we go above 1.5%, we can't even predict what will actually happen. So they're hoping it'll go uh, stay below that. But they also identify in one of the subsections that it's important to encourage large flows of finance to support this. And this is one initiative that has been set up, the Green Climate Fund. Uh, and you can actually have a look at its works program. Several projects have actually already broken ground. So they've got the funding uh, and they are currently um, being um, uh, constructed. Uh, and of course, then we have also a shift in the market, still a small percentage relatively of the global bond market, but green bonds and uh, sustainable bonds are also becoming uh, a very important part of that process of channeling the money to move where the market is and to change uh, the uh, emissions and the way we currently exist. Uh, the Energy Charter Treaty, James has got a smile. I think uh, for me, this is the single most important treaty currently in force. It, it is a multilateral treaty. It has about 50 signatories. The EU is also party and uh, it relates specifically to the energy sector. So I think it's one of the few multinational treaties that specifically relates to uh, encouraging investment, but also has some provisions on environmental and reducing the harmful effects uh, of the energy projects and has a, a protocol on uh, the environmental protection as well. So it's, it's a very important part uh, of that um, protection and mechanism uh, in, in the international legal framework. It also has been, I suppose, used because of part five of the Energy Charter Treaty, which provides um, an investor who's aggrieved by state action to take an arbitration directly against the state for adversely affecting its energy projects. It only relates to energy projects. It is multinational, largely actually drafted by the US, but then they decided not to sign up to it. Um, so there are, as an example, there are some regional equivalents. So the ECOWAS, the East African um, Association has an energy protocol that's very similar to the Energy Charter Treaty, um, but this is uh, the only one that's multilateral. So any questions on the legal regime? I know there's a lot there. I'm going to be very quick because we're already at our time. So I may just have to say that, mention just in passing that as a knock-on impact of the changes that we're seeing mandated by treaties, and of course the treaties maybe are less ambitious than some people would like, but you also have um, the national uh, um, countries making more progressive steps. So a good example is the Climate Change Act of 2008 that was introduced uh, in England and Wales to be able to achieve, um, and actually their ambitions are very high. Uh, so although internationally we seem to be achieving less than you would want or maybe expect at this point, 
regionally and at a national level, the laws can be actually more robust. So there's nothing precluding a state from imposing more obligations on its citizens to change, become more efficient, retrofit the houses, uh, as we had a discussion with uh, with one of uh, James's colleagues in, in London on that. And, and maybe, James, you just want to say one or two words before we close on... Yeah, just on, on, on the Climate Change Act. So, uh, as Nora says, there is uh, a good example of the UK wanting to be uh, demonstrably leading in the field. They've set uh, the framework for the Climate Change Act uh, allows for the the setting of a legally binding limit, which is now net zero by 1950, and that includes uh, aviation and, uh, and shipping, which is unlike any of the other targets I think that other countries have set. Uh, and then there are five-year budgets, which are, the, if you like, the stepping stones to achieving that, which all get reviewed, and they get reviewed by an independent climate change committee uh, and the Climate Change Committee issues its reports and get, they get laid before Parliament. If Parliament, and if they make any criticism, Secretary of State, the relevant minister has to respond in relation to it. So very challenging and demanding targets. When you look at the changes required to life in the UK to achieve it, you, uh, and where we currently stand, you'd have to say it's going to be a big challenge to to meet that legally binding target so nora thank you yeah any questions I, I i'm conscious that obviously there's some very interesting disputes that have arisen there's been commercial disputes investor state disputes i mentioned that there's probably over 50 cases now pending under the energy charter treaty that relates specifically to renewables claims you might have heard the, that spain is a uh, has had a, a very a huge number of cases against it because of its change in the post-financial crisis years in its tariff feed-in tariffs for solar power. So whereas in 2006, 2007, they're saying, come to Spain, the sun can be yours. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> and then all of the very attractive tariffs were cancelled and a lot of investors were very upset about that. So cases were taken under the Energy Charter Treaty with varying degrees of effect. So some Spain has been able to succeed and defend and some they've lost and they've had to pay compensation but there are other cases being taken by ngos sorry james no no i was just saying that's back to exactly what we were talking about before the the risk that you know governments are going to have to shift policy if the targets are going to be met and if they do some of those changes in policy will lead to laws which mean that certain activities that were previously allowed won't be allowed um, and uh, might be coal fired power stations or whatever and you're going to have investors in those um, big infrastructure projects um, being left with an asset that's worth nothing but that will be and then the question will be do they have any legitimate claims against anybody for the change in law that's occurred it's a very complicated area um, yeah. if we're going to meet the targets we're going to have to have some very significant changes and there has been some voice, sorry, some concern voiced about whether or not these international investment treaty arbitrations with three members sitting, are they actually deciding policy and the future direction uh, of, of the policies that are taken by government? So there is some concern about that. Other uh, cases that you are being filed are by either individuals or NGOs. Uh, and uh, the Netherlands, ultimately, the Supreme Court said, actually, yes, you, uh, you do need to do more and upheld the lower court's decision where they said they had not done um, uh, suffic taken, uh, sufficient uh, action uh, to address uh, the emissions. Uh, same as in America, uh, individuals, uh, teenagers taking claims against, directly against the United States saying that they had violated their rights to clean and uh, environmentally stable uh, environment. Unfortunately, that was just dismissed uh, earlier this year on the 17th uh, of January 2020. But there are a raft of cases that are coming. And I have a website uh, that I show you at the next slide where you can actually see a growing number of these types of claims being taken. And this one is still pending. This is a very interesting. It was a Peruvian farmer who sued in Germany, RWE, which is a big um, uh, energy company and pa uh, power producer in Germany. Um, and they said that you have contributed to the damage that has been done to the glaciers in my hometown jurisdiction, and I'm going to sue you for your responsible part. And in fact, it's interesting that it was deemed to be admissible uh, by the regional court uh, in Germany. 
in Germany. So there is now some sort of investigation going on. They're doing some research before they make their decisions. So that's still pending. Uh, uh, you might have heard of Typhoon Yolanda. In fact, that year I was over teaching in dispute resolution in Sydney and um, the few Human Rights Commission in the Philippines have asked actually in their investigation 50 of the largest polluters to come and submit uh, evidence uh, to them. Uh, the report, as far as I'm aware, the full report has not been made public, but the Commission did come out in, in the COP25 last December and say very clearly uh, that there's, there's a link between um, the carbon majors and that they should be held uh, accountable legally and morally. So whether or not there'll be financial damages awarded there, uh, it remains to be seen. But there's just gives you an idea of the range of cases, you know, human rights allegations, uh, individuals, NGOs. Greenpeace actually currently has a case pending against the Irish government for its uh, inaction uh, in, in relation to this. So policy is being pushed, I suppose, uh, uh, from various directions. And this, you can, if you're interested, you can find a lot of the cases, commercial cases, investor state dispute resolution cases, uh, actions on this uh, Grantham Research um, database. That's a very useful uh, thing to play with. Yeah. Now, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I can't seem to upload the files while I'm doing that. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to, to thank all the participants. I'm sorry we've overrun. Um, we didn't really have a chance to, to check the timing of this, but I hope that all of you have found it of interest um, and it's given you some flavour of the kind of things that we talk about. Uh, I'd come back to something that Nora said earlier. We don't expect people to arrive knowing an enormous amount about energy or science or the science of it. You ne merely need to have the enthusiasm and interest to get involved in what is a fascinating sector and remains fundamentally important to all of us in so many different ways. Uh, we're passionate about it and I hope that we'll get an opportunity to meet again and, uh, uh, and demonstrate that to you again. Nora, I don't and know it's you, dynamic. I, absolutely, it's one of the, it's 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 basically it's an area where each year you can't use almost hardly any of your slides from the year before because it's changing so quickly all the time. So it's a very dynamic area uh, of of law, international law, um, regional and national. And I do not seem to be able. I'm not entirely sure why it's slightly different to my own Zoom as to why I can't actually upload the file. So I'll have to ask Petrova to yeah. circulate slides after. Hang on, we have a question, James. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, no, it's just a comment. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Any <laughs> feedback is always appreciated. Petrova has everybody's details, I assume. All of you, when you registered, obviously have given email addresses because we'll make sure you get the slides. And indeed, if you want to follow up with, uh, you'll get our email addresses as well. So if there's anything else. Well, they're, all, they're available on the CCLS website anyway. They're all public. Yes, and by the way, the website, um, we understand, should be going live today, the revised one, so um, fingers crossed. Any other uh, questions? Th thank you. Victor. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> we'll just see one. The, there is so much. One thank you, Chelsea. We've... Uh, We've spoken rather fast, and I apologise for that. And we don't speak quite as fast. Um, well, actually, I can't say I don't. So, yeah. no, no, no. don't worry. We make her say it three different ways, like the psalm. So you'll eventually understand what it is she's saying. <laughs> thank you all very, very much. I'm going to say, yeah, thank you very much. Um, sorry for overrun, and uh, look forward to. Uh, Seeing and meeting you uh, if, if next year, uh, even if we start remotely, uh, hopefully it'll all, all come good in the end and we'll be able to meet in person in London.